1.30, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm here to, well, my title is, Is It Time to Replace MMAP? Um, but it's really, my talk is really a history of virtual memory management, virtual address-based management, um, and I give a proposal for, for the future that solves some of the problems we have today and some of the problems that uh, the project I'm working on is creating. So, I did turn it on. It is indeed on. Well, uh, okay. Let's see if that's any better. Nope. There, okay, there's some pickup. Yeah. Okay, well, there's a wire then. <laughs> okay, is that picking up? No, does not seem to be. Audio available. Okay. Okay, is that picking up at all? No. Nope. It's on. It's on, yeah. Okay. Um, I think. Well, I can. Okay. Let's try that then. Okay. Is that yeah. a little more useful? Okay. So, we're talking about what. I'm going to talk today about what we usually talk, call memory, but in fact what I'm talking about is virtual address space management. Um, and that's a process of both allocating virtual address space and putting something behind it so that it doesn't give you a page fault because there's nothing there when you do it. But first we're going to, so we're going to start with some history. Here we see a timeline of a little bit of the future and the entirety of computing history. Um, you know, you could, you could quibble a bit with the start. Um, there's some arguments you could make, but we'll start there. This is the conventional, his, conventional wisdom of where computing started with ENIAC. Um, Manchester Baby was in 48. Um, I couldn't find any good pictures, so it doesn't get any pictures. Um, and then uh, EDSAC was in uh, 49. Um, and then we're going to skip ahead a bit to the PDP-11, which is what's sort of interesting for us, um, because the PDP-11 is where we really started developing Unix. The actual first version was PDP-7, but um, this is where we really started to have Unix as we know it, and that's what I'm going to focus on. So one little point in this computer architecture history that's worth noting is in 85, we got the, we got the i386, and this was the point where consumer hardware at reasonable prices could conceivably run a Unix system without some serious compromises. Um, so now, I'm going to give you a little refresher on how process address space works, because that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, in an old Unix program, traditional Unix program, you have a big process address space, and the kernel maps the program into memory. You have some code, you have some data, you have BSS, which is a bunch of things that start out as zeros. Um, so all those global variables that were uninitialized, they start as zeros. Um, and then you have a bit of unmapped stuff at the beginning, at least you hope it's unmapped, because um, it's the null pointer. So when you dereference the null pointer, we want to fault to not have interesting things happen. Um, you have a stack. Conventionally, you put the stack up at the top of the process. Um, the stack grows down um, and goes that way. Then you have the heap. That's the stuff above BSS. Um, and the heap grows up. Now, ideally, they don't meet in the middle. <laughs> um, but the heap is, is all your dynamic memory allocations that isn't your program stack. So now, we are going to take a look at how that maps into the physical address space. So these different sections get mapped into the physical address space in different places. doesn't really matter where they go. Um, we have paging mechanisms so we can use physical address space um, efficiently. Some of these things, like the code and data, are backed by disk. And then some of those are mapped copy on write, so that when you write to them in your program, so you change the data in your global variables, or you change your global variables, you don't write that back to disk. Um, amusingly, we are now heading into the world where we do this on purpose, because that's persistent memory. Um, so we are, we are heading back into, the, into what happens if you screw up and don't implement copy on write. Uh, now, think about the 
in the context of this address space, we have two things that we, we track. So as I said, you don't want the heap and the stack to meet in the middle and run into each other. So we manage the break, which is the top of the heap, uh, traditionally. And then we have the stack, the stack pointer. We manage that. So now, let's get back to Unix history. So first, uh, the, the very, very first bit of, of Unix was set 1970-ish in PDP-7. Um, we don't have public documentation of any of that. Um, we start with V1. We see the system, the sysbreak syscall first appears, or at least is first documented. It's there. However, V1, the V1 dump doesn't have any documentation, so you can read the code, you can see what it does. Um, but there's no explanation as to how you ought to use it or whatnot. V2, about the same, except it was renamed to break. You might notice, at that time, it was the break function, so you might notice we're probably not running C yet, um, because break is a keyword in C. Uh, so we're there. V3, in, in 1973, we finally get some documentation. So we get a man page, um, which says that break sets the system's idea of the highest location used by the program to adder, the argument. Locations greater than adder and below the stack pointer are not swapped and, thus, thus are, and are thus liable for unexpected modification. You notice at this point that we're using virtual memory not for protection at all. Um, in fact, what we're, as far as I can tell, what we're using it for is to make process swapping context switching cheaper by not having to change the page mappings for the rest of the pages. At least that's what I infer. Um, and in an extremely minimal system, this is a sensible approach, assuming you don't want fault tolerance or anything like that. Um, so back to the history. V4 Unix, um, the system call has now been renamed to sbreak. Um, and the, uh, the SBRK uh, library call is introduced. So again, break sets the system's idea of the lowest location not used by the, not used by the program to adder. So it says the same thing as before, except backwards. Um, rounded up to uh, the next multiple of 64 bytes, which I don't believe um, SBRK does in modern, modern Unix. And it's interesting to me that it's 64 bytes because words were smaller then. And so I'm wondering what the, what the motivation for that particular rounding choice was on the PDP-11. But I haven't, haven't found out. Sir? That was the granularity of the segmentation of your screen. Ah, that makes sense. And this is why I'm glad that I have old timers in the audience who can correct me or <laughs> on, 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 on my talk. That's quite pleasing. Um, so locations not less than adder and below the stack pointer are not in the address space and thus will cause a memory vi violation in a fast test. So now we're, now we're seeing actual protection um, from, from the virtual memory system. So continuing on through the manual, we see the, uh, the manual for SBRK, which is the C interface to the break command. Uh, the SBRK command takes an increment, which is positive or negative, um, and moves the break, and then returns a pointer to that location. Um, so Inker adds more bytes to the program's data space, um, and a pointer is returned to the start of the new area. Um, another bit, when a program begins execution, another, oh, another snippet I found that I thought was kind of interesting. Um, when a program begins execution via exec, the break is set to the highest location defined by the program, so that's the end of BSS. And, or, and the data storage area, so that's the end of BSS. Ordinarily, therefore, only programs with growing data areas need to use break. I read this and I sort of giggled to myself, and I was like, programs that don't use dynamic memory allocation, that's really weird. And I said this in when I gave this talk before at BSDTW, and one of my co-presenters uh, pointed out he works in high-performance computing, and in high-performance computing, that's the norm. You statically define the size of all your giant arrays, and you recompile when you want a new array. And that's, that's the world that was there, and that's the world today. And in fact, there's a bunch of good reasons for that in HPC, because that means you have static-sized loops, and you can unroll them without, without uh, any limit. Don't forget that we were on 16-bit machines right then. There wasn't a lot of memory to allocate in the first place. Absolutely. <laughs> 
So I probably had too many, uh, too many Fs in my, uh, my uh, address space uh, diagram, even with the dots. <laughs> okay, so here we are back, you know, here's, here's where SBRK was introduced again. Um, so in uh, 75, V4 introduced break, which is another interface to the same thing. Um, it's just another software interface. And then in um, 1983, 4.4 BSD documents MMAP, but does not implement it, um, and, and the whole family of interfaces. Um, and we'll get, we'll get to what those interfaces are. Um, but first, let's look at some problems with the break interface. Um, so things that don't work real well. So one problem is heap fragmentation. So with, with break, you keep incrementing, 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 you're allocating some memory. Then you slide this huge thing that you've allocated previously, you don't want that anymore. We can't give it back to the kernel. Now you have to do bookkeeping, so you can remember that you can reuse it. Um, so that's that's not great. Um, you know, on a on a 16-bit machine, you're probably very carefully doing that bookkeeping, possibly hard coded. But in this case, you know, once you start to see 32-bit and 64-bit machines, this becomes problematic. You have to do a bunch of work. Um, another issue is that you'd like to have memory sharing. So let's consider an LS program. This is a statically linked LS program, um, you know, mapped into physical address space. If we start another one, um, we should be able to share the code, and we should be able to share the data, or part of the data, um, the, the read-only part of the data. And then we can't share the BSS, we can't share the heap, and we can't share the stack, Oops. Um, which makes sense. We can do this with a statically linked program with SBRK because the kernel does these mappings. So it can make sure that it shares the pages. Um, but when we get to dynamic linking, we've got some new problems. Now in a dynamically linked program, the kernel initially maps the stack, the program, and the runtime linker. The runtime linker is then started, and it maps libc. And libc, of course, the proportions here are probably exactly opposite for your average program. Uh, <laughs> libc is a bloated beast, and you know, cat um, has far more arguments that it sh has far more code than it should, but nonetheless is small, um, or ls even is pretty small. So you'd like to have sharing there, but if you were using SBRK to allocate some space, opening libc and read, read, you know, reading it and then splatting it into memory, you wouldn't have any sharing. Um, and you, you, know, you could do ridiculous things, but you're not going to do ridiculous memory deduplication here. Um, so that's another problem. So you've got your heap here again. Um, so and then let's consider multi-threaded programs. Um, we have a new way to create heap fragmentation. You start, spawn a thread with SBRK, you give it a stack. Oh, now we need some more heap. You know, some more heap. That's not what you want especially because when your threads exit, then you've got these little stack bits left in there um, that you would need to reclaim. Instead, you'd really like your stack to be off somewhere else with some nice guard pages around it, so when you walk off the end, things go boom instead of something else. Um, so that, that's you know, some of the problems that I feel probably motivated the MMAP interface. That's all backformed, but um, that's you know, things that are why you don't want, just want SBRK. So let's talk about the MMAP interface as documented in 4.2 BSD. So we have MMAP, of course. It allocates address space and alters backing mappings. Um, we have MUnmap, which removes backings. Um, we have MRemap was documented. BSDs, as far as I know, none of them have ever implemented it. Um, Linux does implement it. It is, it has all the perils of realloc except with page management. Uh, um, and it is typically, so it's interesting. Um, it's not the worst idea, but it's really easy to screw up um, realloc. So, so uh, support. It would be good to know, well, it would be good to study how they're using it. So there are some usage models that are very useful and that are, you know, safe and manageable. And there are other ones that I find unlikely people would get right. Um, and in particular, once you add Cherry, which I'll talk about in a bit to the mix, it gets quite complicated. I think it is all doable. 
question is, are you adding so much complexity? Well, are you, are you adding interfaces that are easy to get wrong? And MMAP is easy enough to screw up. Um, we have the memory mProtect. mProtect alters the permissions on pages. Um, so you can, for instance, create a writable page and then make it executable later if you're using a JIT compiler, things like that. mAdvise provides usage hints to the kernel and also for reasons that I have not quite figured out. Um, there's also mAdvise free, which unmaps pages effectively, which is a, effectively an unmap remap operation um, and probably shouldn't have been in there, but that arrived at some point. Um, mIncore gives you a one character per page um, status of what, what's the state of a given page um, for a range. Um, and then SBRK, of course, was documented, and SSTK, um, which is like SBRK, but for moving the stack down. Um, now, in 4.2 BSD, SBRK was implemented. Um, interestingly, S SSTK, as far as I can tell, is another one of those things that was never implemented. Um, I think I did just recently shoot it in FreeBSD. Uh, the empty implementation. Hmm? <laughs> so, yeah, that was, that was a fun one. It, well, the, the, there, was, there was the stub implementation always. The stub implementation changed quite a lot over time, uh, <laughs> including getting an MP safe marker. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, one of those things about code debt. Um, so we had the first, here, here we are, back to the first references. And then in 1990, um, 4.3 uh, Reno had MMAP as implemented from mock. Um, and I don't know when the actual, I, well, I think I looked up when the actual commit was, but didn't write it down here. Um, but uh, one of the things that was, I found interesting when I was doing all this splunking, which was mostly in the Unix history repo, um, was that the sort of the, the wisdom I had gotten more, you know, from just talking to people was I thought that MMAP came from mock. Um, but I'm not, but the documentation is before any mock release. Um, and the mock interfaces are totally different and kind of weird. So I sort of, I, I'm curious what the actual history was there. Yeah, yeah, because I, I knew, yeah, I knew we had we had taken their stuff, and I just so, but I had somehow absorbed this idea that we got MMAP from mock, but it's in fact we got the implementation from mock, but not, not the actual interface. Um, so, so a few more um, points along the scale before I go and start tearing down uh, MMAP a bit. Um, so, in uh, two thousand three. OpenBSD implemented uh, WXRX, so the idea that no page should ever, ever be both writable and executable. Um, so this is a good thing. Um, prevents you from splatting shell code straight into a, you know, straight onto your stack and then running it, ideally. Um, all that good stuff. Um, so there are some issues with WXRX. So there's some, some things you have to solve. So one of them is that with a just-in-time compiler, you need a writable page, um, but you can't have it both writable and executable. So you need some writable space. You need to, uh, so generally what you do is you map something writable, and then you remove write and add exec. Um, this leads to an interesting thing in the OpenBSD implementation. Um, because there's no way to exp express what the maximum permissions are on a page, um, or what the maximum permissions you should allow on a page, every page is allowed to become executable. Um, you have to make a system call to do it um, with M and call mProtect, but exec is always added to the, uh, to the max prot permissions, um, which is a bit suboptimal. Um, but it's because MMAP can't express this, uh, this concept. Or how do you do JITs? Uh, we, we have an interface that allows um, certain protections to be toggled um, for applications for JIT purposes. So you turn that feature off in something that JITs. Right. Yeah. There's, there's two parts to the yeah. feature. There's the MMAP part and the MMAP part. And they can be toggled individually. 
That makes sense. So there's that. And then one more that's relevant to the, more, the rest of my discussion um, is that in 2012, um, the project that I'm, I've been working on since then uh, kicked off. I think we wrote proposals in, well, we, other people wrote proposals in 2010. Um, but Cherry changes the way we do pointers. So in Cherry, pointers have bounds and permissions associated with them. They're a bit bigger. Um, architecturally, they look like they're, they contain 256 bits of data, more or less. In practice, they're 128 bits in memory. So we double the size of pointers. But for that, we get strong bounds and we get permissions on pointers. So you can have load and store uh, permissions and you have exec permissions. And then we have strong monotonicity guarantees on manipulating pointers, which is to say that if I have a pointer that has just write permission on it, just, just store permission, I cannot add um, load permission to it. I cannot make, manipulate it to create a capability, with, uh, capability pointer with load permission. Now, so you need to make your decisions early. Um, but you, so we'd like to do WXRX on pointers, but MMAP returns a pointer, and there's no way to get a new pointer when you decide to toggle um, from um, read-write to execute only or write or read-execute, more likely. Um, so some API change is required to handle this situation if you want to do this. Um, you know, one option you could take here is that you could let mProtect return a pointer, um, which could then, when you give you a pointer with the new permissions you created, that would be one way to go. Um, or you might need some other mechanism. So that's a, a place where Cherry requires that we make some changes here. There's also some MMAP functionality issues. So MMAP just manages the virtual address space as this open expansive thing. It takes integer arguments, including that pointer hint. That's just an integer. Um, and it conflates address reservation and mapping of stuff behind it. Um, and the lack of boundaries on reservation is what gives us things like stack clash. Um, because you create a stack, and from that reference to your stack, you can just keep going, and you can jump into another stack. Um, you can do math on those things. So Cherry would help you, but it's also, you can make math errors and think you're manipulating inside that reservation you made and really be off somewhere else in the address space doing stuff um, and making a mess of things. Um, there's also a, some lack of expressiveness in the interface. So for instance, there's no portable way to express alignment alignment of things. So if you want more, well, you get page alignment no matter what. Um, but if you say wanted super page alignment, FreeBSD has a flag. But there's no portable way to say, I want something super page aligned or I want something, I don't know, a megabyte, you know, megabyte aligned or something if for some hardware reason you need that. Um, there's also no way, as I alluded to before, to express a maximum permissions on a mapping, which you would like to do, in my feel. Um, so another problem with MMAP, too many damn arguments. Uh, <laughs> you know, can, 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 you know, how many people can just sit down and write them all down in order, write? You know, many people can. Many of the best programmers I know are like, nope, I read the manual. Um, if I haven't been writing MMAP calls all day, I'm reading the manual. Um, and then many calls don't use all of them. So you have to get them all right, and then you have to not screw it up. And then we have way too many failure modes. So FreeBSD 11.1 had 19 documented errors, 14 of which were E and Val, or 15 of which were E and Val. So if the kernel says no, then what did I do wrong? What the, what's going on? You know? And then you know, we made it worse. We introduced MapGuard. Um, that added, I think, another four documented E and Vals. And I think it's actually considerably worse than that, because there is one giant if statement of if this if this and this and this, but map guard no, blah, or you know, but not this and that and what thing. It's four lines long. Um, and it's all just, yeah, if any of this is happens, E and Val. Um, <laughs> you know, in our tree, I got so fed up with this, I added a new um, K trace probe, which is sys error cause, <laughs> and inserted code and broke up all the if statements. And so I splat ASCII strings into the log that say, you did, it happened this way because your pointer permissions were this and this was expected. Um, 
So there's more, way, more ways to fail, but um, I wrote them out. I have not fully updated the latest one, and I've not tried to upstream that, but, um, but you know, that's, that's a problem we have here. Some other MMAP issues. Um, there's no support for mapping more pages than requested. What I mean by that is if you were using, for instance, non-transparent super pages, um, and you wanted to map something that's like one page short of the super page size, and it's a file, you know, you might want to just map a super page size thing and fill it in. Um, you know, there's good reasons for our design, but you might want to do things like that. Also, in Cherry, as I alluded, we have 256 bits of data in 128 bits. And the way we do that is we compress our bounds. So at larger sizes, um, the granularity of your bounds goes up from byte granularity to, you know, one, a little bit at a time. Um, and so if you allocate more than a gigabyte of memory in one go um, in the current design, then, you know, if you allocate two gigabytes of memory or something in between one and two gigabytes of memory, your granularity is two pages now. Um, and so the kernel either would have to do all sorts of shenanigans to reserve that page and not give it out to somebody else, the extra page, or demand that you do it. Um, or it could round it up if we were, had a way to do that. But there's no sensible interface to say, actually, I have did this. Um, ironically, this is something that for all of the horror that is System 5 shared memory, they got this right. Um, there's a handle to your allocation. You free the whole thing at once, um, and there's no, and so it can be whatever size it wants, as long as it's as big as you asked for. And as I alluded to previously, there's no concept of ownership in the address space. So if you make a reservation, you get your math wrong, you could be stomping on some other stack. Um, so that's not good. Um, you know, I would like to say, I want to reserve some space, and I want to put some things in it, and if I try to put some things outside of it, then I clearly didn't mean to do that. Um, so, you know, let's, let's not support that. Um, so there are some non-portable solutions to some things. So John Baldwin, at, so we got the aligned super flag, uh, which is, you know, give me something super page aligned, because I know it's going to be bigger than super pages, or in the case of RTLD, we just figure, eh, whatever, um, a little fragmentation doesn't hurt, and we actually super page align every, all libraries. Um, and also map aligned allows arbitrary power of two alignment. And those are, there are flags you pour into the flags. So that's nice, it works well, it's non-portable though. Um, and then coming soon, we're planning to bring in an additional set of protection flags. There's a max prop macro inside of which you put the protections you want to be. Um, you want to be the maximum protections, and or that with your other protections, um, and we'll be able to set max prot. So these are non-portable ways we can deal with some of these problems, and we want to do this to bring uh, to help us bring WXRX into the tree, because um, in most cases it's a one-line change um, to a program. Say, oh, you know that, you know Beehive, for instance, maps maps prop none, the address space of the VM, and then loads things into it with protections. Well, if we just make a little tweak there and say, yeah, let's, let's map that with a max prot, with the max prot of RWX, because that's what it needs, um, but we can still map it prot none, and we don't have to worry about um, sort of increasing the permissions on the pointer if the pointer were a cherry pointer. So, now I have sort of an RFC for a new interface, um, which solves a bunch of the problems we have um, and solves some of these problems I've alluded to. Um, so the new interface, the first part of it is CM reserve. C started as capability, now it's cookie, because cookies are good. Uh, <laughs> and my goal here is to have an interface which, is, which provides benefit even without um, Capability, capability memory management or, or capability memory protection or without other pointer integrity schemes, which is the reason I designed it. But the goal is to have benefits for everyone. So CM reserve reserves some address space. It takes a reservation object, which I'll get into in a bit, um, a length, because obviously you're reserving some address space, um, a hint, which is the, uh, the fixed address that you want to map at, um, potentially, protection, um, including a maximum protection, um, and then returns a request object, Retur returns a, yeah, and, and takes a request object. Um, 
Once you get, once you get a successful reservation, you can then get a pointer to it. Um, and the reason we separate getting a pointer to it from making the reservation is that in the cherry world, I want to be able to get a read-write pointer and a write-execute pointer, or a, a read-execute pointer separately. And I don't ever want user space to have both. Um, we have discussed, but I think no one, is, no one is, has enough guts to do a hardware implementation where there are no read-write-execute pointers. But that is something you could do. It could literally mean there is never one, and you can't manufacture one no matter what you do. Um, so, but we'd, so we'd like to support that use case. Next, there's CM map, because one of the common things you do with MMAP is you map in part of a library. You, you, know, you map in a library, and then you map in the BSS at the end as a bunch of anonymous pages. So you need to be able to take your reservation and manipulate the mappings underneath it. Um, we have a close, which is, say, get rid of the handle we've created, um, which means now you can't manipulate it anymore. Um, so if you wanted immutable page mappings, this will give you immutable page mappings. Um, so you have to exit if you want to get rid of these. Um, we have a concept of a CM restrict, which is there's a bunch of operations you could perform. We might want to leave the handle open, but only let you unmap um, so that you can't monkey around with uh, monkey around with permissions anymore, for instance. Um, idea of a stat function. Um, the idea here is to allow introspection at a level, at a more interesting level than that provided by um, <clears throat> uh, M in core. So the information is there, for instance, to tell you what object match it maps, is, what objects are mapped into a, a reservation. So we'd like to be able to query that. There are some interesting challenges here, because obviously if you do this wrong, um, you can break ASLR by enumerating through the handles. Um, so you don't want that, but uh, we have ideas on how to fix that. Um, and then the other M, M advise, M in core, M inherit, M sync, M unmap, all those would be just the same as before, except that they only operate on a single reservation or on regions within that. So a little bit more on map requests. My idea is to map, is to have map requests follow the model of pthread adder t. So you have a request object. It's an opaque thing. Um, you, you initialize it. You make some manipulations to it. You set you know, which file you want on it uh, and whatnot. And then using accessors, and then you pass it on to, to mreserve or um, to uh, M -map, M CM map. Um, and the goal is to have useful defaults. So ideally, you do as little as possible. So if you just want some empty pages, like malloc does, it should be no more than like two calls. Um, and it's a little on Unixy, but you know, POSIX does it. And my hope is that it'll be less error prone than uh, the mess that is uh, CM map. Now, a couple of cherry extensions. So in addition to the C get pointer that we had before, I've added a C get cap so I can retrieve a, a capability pointer, um, not just a virtual address. Um, it also C end perms, which allows you to restrict the set of permissions on future pointers returned by C get cap. Um, because there's a default set of permissions that any mapping gets that would be dictated by the max prot, but there are other permissions that normally we would give to uh, capabilities um, that are created by the kernel for user space. And you might say, eh, I don't want those, yeah. for whatever reason. So that's my proposal. Um, so independent of my proposal, what do people think? Is it time for something new? No. Nope. No. Oh, I heard one. <laughs> I, I'm still thinking we should go back to using the bracelet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so part of the, it, it seems to me that part of what you're running into here is the fact that someone, we embraced everything with the backs so and just kept extending. It. Yes. I guess. A model which would have actually fit kind of well with this. Mm -hmm. Extended it the very obvious way. Yeah, that was not something I, I guess, I don't think I have access. Have, which, is it in, is the 286 stuff in the Unix history repo? I, I remember running Xenix on the 286. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I glossed over it in that I knew there were things, but there were more compromises there, less of an MMU, you know, things without an MMU are more. 
Yeah. Uh, you're so to clarify the get pointer uh -huh. are you saying that when we get, uh, if I would like to get a read write mapping to some range and a read execute mapping to some range, that potentially these would be different addresses and I would have, like, my, like with some way that you're just like, where I have two mappings in the same batch and one is different. So, my, my, current pro my current proposal does is, is about address-based management, so it doesn't do that. Um, you could conceive of a proposal where you say, I want another mapping to the stuff behind this mapping, so a new handle, and do that. But the goal of the proposal is that in, so in Cherry, pointers have permissions, fundamentally. So I could have, I could have you know, I, you, you would do the thing where you make writable pages, write to them, and then, um, turn them executable, and then similarly you would have, but because we don't want you to ever have a pointer that's capable of both reading and writing, you need a way to get two pointers. And so that's the reason for the cget cap, cm get cap. Sean. Absolutely. And uh, Capsicum has shown that we're not really all that successful in that. Um, it, it, well, so part of the goal here is you should be able to implement MMAP on top of this. And in fact, there's nothing stopping you from doing a poor implementation of this on top of MMAP. Um, that's, that's the goal and probably something we would do before we made a proposal. Um, so that there is an adoption path that, that you know works on shitty Android phones that have never get updates, um, but you know we are talking to people who maintain other operating systems. So. I was just going to comment that if we implement MMAP on top of this, then yep. sure. So it seems like the Malloc that we're going to do several MMAPs over time to get to an MP or even bigger, and in particular thing mapping. So yeah, I turn that off in Cherry. Um, I, fa I fail, so I, in, in my adaptation of JML to Cherry, I just make M all the map fixed requests fail because I know that's what, it, what they're trying to do. Um, and you can't glue two capabilities together. We don't provide a facility to do that. Um, we could, but <coughs> that's a very significant, I mean, there's no reason that you couldn't have a syscall that says, so I have these two capabilities, please glue them together and give me a new one. But that definitely is non-monotonic behavior, so you have to be very careful. Um, so we may, I, that's, that's something we've not explored because it's turned out we haven't really needed to do it. Um, I think it does have some impacts in J.A. Malloc, um, in particular because J.A. Malloc has made some, some decisions about small, small buckets. Um, that mean there are really bizarre performance cliffs. Um, if you slightly increasing the size of a data structure can cause you to go into the next bucket and then allocate seven times as many pages or do seven times as many MMAPs um, for the same number of small allocations because you go from a seven page bucket to a one page bucket. Um, and that minimizes absolute fragmentation at the cost, at considerable performance cost in some cases. Eric? Third 
is some manner of call interface uh, to be able to say, okay, kick me back here if this page is, is not present, or <coughs> tell me when pages are about to be kicked. Uh, the benefits to garbage collection, particularly of the, the latter, are substantial. Uh, speaking of garbage collection, have you looked into Linux's user port FD interface? No. User port FD is uh, manipulating map areas so that you can be notified when a page is written or wrote to. Mm -hmm. Interesting. We'll have to look at that. We do have somebody actually looking actively at garbage collection yeah. um, and, and looking at a non-reuse model. Look at uh, paper, I believe, like this old, but uh, Matthew Bergson and Rick Berger um, book marking garbage collection. I think that's the name of it. But that, yeah, that, that discusses uh, that on call. Uh, and the benefits are quite substantial. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, That would be, well, <clears throat> it's not something I've really thought about much, but the request object format should, I think, help us, you know, give us a place to, to have uh, more than just, you know, our current 32 flags. So more things we can ask for, and I think that would be something to explore before anyone tried to standardize something. I definitely agree. A little time, so I'll give you a little bit more here. Um, so, another point in history. Um, in uh, 2016, we decided as an experiment to ship uh, ARM, ARM64 and RISC V without SBRK. Um, it, you know, uh, mostly it turns out it's used for incorrect measure, attempts to measure heap use. Um, I fixed the documentation so it says those don't work, um, but it's still there. Um, uh, most of, some of them require some force to disable. Um, there's also some internal allocators. Um, the funnest one, I think, was probably all the GNU bin utils crap. Um, tries really hard to find SBRK. So if the symbol is there, but the, you know, it's, it's fine if there's no symbol. Uh, actually, I don't, I don't think it will call system itself. <laughs> Um, but it does, it, it's fine if you don't declare it. It'll just look for it and use it. It doesn't need it, but it wants it anyway. It's very important. So, um, and then some, some Lisp interpreters, uh, mostly unpopular ones. Um, but, you know, we did win the editor war because um, we broke Emacs. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, oops. Um, turns out, so Emacs did finally, this year, um, did finally implement an SBRK list implementation. Um, they decided to join the 80s. And uh, so it's very good. Andy? They did call us mad. Yes, they did call us mad. But, you know. Did you laugh appropriately? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we said, you know, it's been documented since 83, guys. And, and SBRK has been deprecated since the early 90s. Um, 
So, you know, now Emacs works without SPRK. I'm planning to finish killing these silly things off in FreeBSD 13, because it's time. If you really need it, there's plenty of ways you could do a pure user space implementation. Um, and really, all you need to do is allocate more BSS and have a big symbol. <laughs> and for most uses, that'll just work. So that's all I've got. Thank you for coming. I'm happy to take any more questions if you do have them. Yes. Well, I just wanted to reinforce. Uh, if you are doing this, I would really like to get the step process that maybe we integrate at least the API <coughs> and user folder key. Because um, so it's really annoying <coughs> that people like uh, me yeah. <laughs> currently use segmentation for all handlers for this kind of yeah. thing. So we we have we have people who are actively working on garbage collection. So I will send them this, send them this, and say they should implement it in FreeBSD so they can test it. And they're good, so they should do a good job. So I think we should I think we should do that regardless of what happens to an MF alternative. Uh, for SBRK, we could. Um, i a little worried that if I put the linker warnings in, I will break ports too much. Um, I mean, you can always ignore the deprecated warnings. Um, so I could, I could try, I could do that. If you <coughs> think that'd be appropriate, I'll do that. Uh, just, uh, to so we're also go we're, we're Ed, Ed was pushing me to do an X run, so we'll get that done soon. Um, I, know, I know a new one popped up recently, which is why the documentation was updated. Because uh, I broke something. Um, it was again, you know, some some old interpreted language. So. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone. <laughs>